Well, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to ACL Educational Excellence Webinar Series. Today is Wednesday, December the 10th, 2014. My name is Lena Zhao. I'm the Global Marketing Manager for ACL Biosciences. I will be your host today. Um, Dr. Bongs is our featured speaker today. Uh, the title of his talk is Five Specific Antibody Constructs Mediate Immunotherapeutic Retargeting of Effector Cells Toward HBV-Infected Target Cells. Dr. Bong will give uh, about a 40 minutes presentation, then we'll open the discussion to questions submitted by you. You can post your question at any time throughout the presentation by type at the chat box and send to ACA Bio, and we'll do our best to get to your questions. Dr. Felix Bung is a group leader at the Institution of Virology, German Research Center for Environmental Health. His current research focuses on better understanding the interaction of HPV and HCV virus with their host, as well as developing new therapeutic strategies to treat chronic viral hepatitis and hepatitis cellular carcinoma. Dr. Bung received his PhD in genetics from University of Cologne. He undertook postdoctoral training at Hospital Clinic of Barcelona in immunology of liver transplantation, then completed the prestige personal postdoctoral fellowship granted by DFG at the Technology University of Munich and at German Research, Research Center for Environmental Health. We're very glad that he can take time of his busy schedule to talk with us today. Chronic viral hepatitis is a major public health threat. Currently, strategies to eradicate the virus and treatment for viral-induced liver disease are very limited. Novel therapeutic strategies are in urgent need. The immunotherapeutic retargeting of effector cell is a promising approach to circum circumvent the immunotolerance stage found in malignancy and chronic viral infection. In this webinar, Dr. Bong will present his latest work on how Exelligence RTCA technology in conjunction with other cell cellular tools were utilized in the discovery of bispecific antibody construct as a promising new immunotherapeutic approach against chronic hepatitis B. So before um, I turn the presentation over to Dr. Bong, I would like to spend a few minutes to give you a quick intro about ACEA and Exelligence label-free real-time cell analysis technology. Founded in 2002, ACA Biosciences is a pioneer in developing and commercializing of high-performance cutting-edge cellular analysis platforms for life science research. ACA's Exelligence impedance-based label-free real-time cell analysis system and Novocyte benchtop flow cytometry are used in preclinical drug discovery and development, toxicology, safety pharmacology, and basic ad academic research. Um, so in the past few years, um, we have seen a steady growth of the publication citing Exelligence um, technology. Uh, as of now, there are over 600 publications already. So here is the workflow of Exelligence real-time cell analyzer. Adherent cells um, can be directly passaged into microtiter e-plate, then transferred to the real-time cell analyzer station that is designed to be placed in the standard tissue culture incubator, which provides physiological temperature, CO2, and humidity control. Then the cell adhesion and uh, growth cytotoxic effect can be monitored in real time automatically. Um, so in each well of the e-plate, the um, the bottom of the well is covered by the interdigitated gold microelectrode biosensor. Um, a very small current is applied, so electron can flow across the gap between the electrode since media is conductive. When cells are seated in the, in the well, they act as a little insulator when attached, impeding electric current flow. The impedance is analogous to resistance in direct current circuit since um, the alternating current is applied. So this is really sensitive to the cell number um, changes and the morphology change and attachment change of the cell um, attached to the microelectrode biosensor. Um, so um, there are actually um, many applications for exogenous, but today uh, we'll focus on cell-mediated cytotoxicity 
And um, I would like to give you a, a kind of a one minute overview. You probably already know this. So the gold standard for cell media cytotoxin and ADTCS is chromium uh, release assay, but it will involve uh, many wash incubation steps and the spontaneous leakage from the dye or chromium um, you know, limit the duration of the experiment to four hours, and there are additional cell handling and uh, data analysis. In contract, the impedance-based accelerant RTCA system, uh, because the micro um, electrode can only sense adherent uh, cells, which is the target cell, uh, not sensitive to the uh, the uh, effector cell. We're only looking at um, the growth or the apoptosis or necrosis of the target cells. Uh, and since the analyzer is uh, in the incubator, therefore we can monitor um, a long time, like hours, not just hours, but days and weeks. So with that, I would like to um, turn the uh, mic to uh, our featured speaker, Dr. Bonds. And uh, Dr. Bonds, if you can, um, Unmute your mic, and uh, we're ready uh, for your presentation. Perfect, Lena. Thank you very much. So welcome to everybody. I'm really thrilled to be here presenting our data today. I'm going to turn on the video. We want to try this also with the video. And now where do I find? Now we can see you. Where, where do I find the share the desktop? Oh, yeah, I got it now. Okay. Yes. Work. There we go. Okay, perfect. So again, uh, a very warm welcome to everybody. I'm really thrilled that I was invited to give this uh, webinar today. It's my first webinar, so <laughs> I'm really also interested in the outcome of the whole thing. Thank you very much to Lena for the very kind introduction. And uh, so I'm going to start my presentation. The title is Five Specific Antibody Constructs Mediating Immunotherapeutic Retargeting of Effector Cells Towards HBV Infected Target Cells. <clears throat> so the outline, I want to start with a brief introduction about uh, HBV, the virus, and um, the persistence which it, um, it produces. Then I'm going to talk about design uh, and function of uh, immunotherapeutics that we're developing for treatment um, opportunities. Uh, I'm going to present newest results that we obtained from these uh, immunotherapeutic approaches. And in the end, I'm going to summarize the, the uh, um, speech and uh, give you a short conclusion. So the hepatitis B virus, this is um, the, the virus um, we are mainly working on here at the Institute of Virology in Munich. It's a, um, a, it's a very um, small virus. It belongs to the group um, number seven of the Baltimore. Um, um, the, it's a double-stranded DNA virus, but it also depends on a reverse transcriptase um, step. So it's a, a little bit weird in the, in the groups of the viruses. The family is called uh, Hepatna viridae, and there's two genus, the ortohepatna viruses, which are all the, the ape and human um, species, and there's another genus which is uh, containing the, the um, bird Hepatna viruses. And the species which infects mainly humans is the hepatitis B virus, and the name already says it, it causes hepatitis B. As you can see here in this electron micrography is um, apart from the virus particles, which you can see here with a double layer, infected cells in the liver produce a vast amount of so-called subviral particles. And this is the structures that you can see around. They can be spherical with a, a, a diameter of around 20 nanometers, or they can build these filamentous structures, which also have a diameter of 20 nanometers, but they have varying lengths. The hepatitis B virus has a very narrow um, host tropism, so it basically only infects humans and, uh, and, and uh, chimpanzees and orangutans, but nothing else. And it's also a problem for the research because uh, um, it's not so easy to find proper animal models for this virus. And also the organ tropism is very narrow. It, it only infects hepatocytes in the liver. And this is really the only um, target cell that the virus can, uh, can infect. 
to the global prevalence in the uh, in the Western countries, the, the situation is not so severe. So less than two percent of the population uh, um, um, carries the virus. But there is a huge problem in, in sub-Saharan um, Africa and also in the uh, uh, in the East uh, Asia, where there is a, a, a vertical transmission of the virus from the um, HPV carrying mother to the newborn child, and this is a, a huge problem because also the vaccination strategy, there is a, a really fine working um, vaccine for hepatitis B virus cannot help in this situation because the newborn infant is directly infected before it can be, uh, before it can be vaccinated properly. There's approaches to give um, vaccine and together with uh, antibodies raised against hepatitis B virus directly after birth and this helps a lot. But still, it's a huge problem that this vertical um, um, transmission takes place, and um, there's not much you can do. And then in the long term, um, there's a huge um, problems with the, the chronic infection that can develop. But I'll get back to that later. The hepatitis B virus particle is also called Dane particle um, um, after the, the um, um, professor who found it first. It's an envelope particle. It's um, very small, 42 nanometers in diameter. Um, the, uh, it contains of an outer lipid shell where you see the three different surface proteins incorporated. They're called pre-S1 or the large L protein, pre-S2, which is the medium M protein, and S, which is the small um, surface protein. And this outer um, lipid shell envelopes the viral capsid, the nucleocapsid, which is composed of uh, one single viral protein, the core protein. And within this capsid, you have the, the double-stranded, but only partially double-stranded um, DNA genome. And this is still connected to the viral polymerase, which consists of the reverse transcriptase and also an, an RNase and the terminal protein. And apart from this, here you see again depicted the um, subviral particles, which are either spherical, and they only contain the lipid shell together with the viral surface protein. And these um, small spherical particles mainly contain the, the small and the medium, medium proteins. And there's also the filamentous particles, which additionally contain the, um, the large L protein, the pre-S1. And what you can also see in this picture is that some um, of the L proteins can change their conformation and, and um, flip this um, outer portion to the inside, which happens uh, randomly. But this is important for the contact between the um, viral envelope and the nucleocapsid. And these um, subviral particles are produced in a huge excess, up to 10,000 times the amount of virus particles. And it's believed that this is uh, um, to, to evade from the new reaction to catch away and um, neutralizing antibodies in the infected host. <coughs> The, um, the genome of the hepatitis C virus is also pretty small. It's um, um, roughly 3.2 um, kilobases. It's, uh, as I said, partially double-stranded, and it's got four largely um, overlapping open reading, reading frames. And this is really important to get as much information um, as possible on this very small genome. And this is, uh, in the end, to save the, the space. So the, these reading frames um, are basically the, the um, surface proteins, the pre-S1, pre-S2, and the S. And they, um, they only change between the three different forms of the surface proteins by internal start codons, which can be switched. Then the longest reading frame is the P reading frame. This is the polymerase, which, as I already said, is a reverse transcriptase together with an RNase um, and uh, the terminal protein. Then there's the core reading frame, which can also start from a secondary um, start codon in the, in the middle to produce a, the capsid protein, but it can also produce a longer form, which is called the pre-C, which has a regulatory function, as well as the X protein, which is also a regulatory protein and also involved in um, carcinogenesis. <coughs> So to the replication cycle and the infection of hepatitis B virus, as I um, already said, the target cell is uh, hepatocytes. And I want to start with the attachment. And this is also pretty new. It was just last year that the um, attachment receptor for the hepatitis B virus was discovered. 
It's a, a protein called NTCT, and this is basically a transporter for um, bile salts. Nobody really expected this. And then after um, an attachment to the, to the cell surface of the hepatocyte, the um, virus uncodes and the capsid is released into the cytoplasm and the capsid is then transported to the nucleus. And at the pore of the, of the nucleus, the capsid also dissolves and releases this partially double-stranded um, DNA molecule into the nucleus of the target cell. And thereby, um, cell intrinsic repair mechanisms this um, partially double-stranded uh, um, genome is, is um, repaired and completed into a double-stranded form, which is then called CCC DNA or covalently closed circular DNA. And this behaves um, like a mini chromosome. It's very stable. It's got a very long half-life, and it can even be passed on to daughter cells. And this is one of the main problems with the hepatitis B virus, because there's until now no real treatment to get rid of this CCC DNA, but I will get back to this later. <clears throat> From the CCC DNA, the viral RNAs are transcribed, and there's different classes um, of RNAs. The, the longest one is an overlength RNA, it's the so-called pregenomic um, RNA. This um, first codes for the C and the P protein, but it's also, as the name says, pregenomic. So this is the um, RNA molecule from which then, after packaging into the nuclear capsid, the reverse transcription takes place and this new DNA genome is produced within the nuclear capsid. And then there's um, further subgenomic RNAs, which are the mRNAs for the surface proteins and for the um, regulatory X proteins. After translation of the three um, surface proteins, these are transmembranous proteins, and they are um, translated into the um, ER membrane, where they are then present for the envelopment of the nuclear capsid. There's a, a, an interaction between the core protein and these um, L proteins, and by passing through the membrane uh, into the ER, these um, final and mature viral particles are formed. And then there's, uh, this is also very new, the viral particles, so the infectious particles, they are secreted um, via the uh, multivesicular body pathway, while subviral particles are exported um, via transology. And uh, this is a very important point now because this is um, basically the target for our immunotherapeutics. Our working model is that not all of these viral surface proteins are incorporated into the viral particles. And together with um, vesicles or uh, transport mechanisms, these proteins end up on the surface of the infected cell. And this is where our um, immunotherapeutic approaches um, kick in because this is our target antigen that we um, target with the immunotherapeutic um, um, approaches that we follow. <clears throat> Very important because this is what our critics always say is that uh, the subviral particles and viral particles, they have a, a, an intrinsic stickiness. So we always have to control that we get uh, not an unspecific binding of such subviral particles, which might be um, um, attached unspecifically to the surface of a cell. Because if this would be the case, um, of course, our immunotherapeutics would target other cells and not just the um, HPV infected target cells, so we always have to pretty um, 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 fairly control for these um, um, binding events of subviral particles to um, other cell types and uh, um, specific HPV negative target cells. And then last, um, there's uh, also a re-import of these um, uh, mature capsids, which then act like in the first uh, uh, infection event. And they are re-imported to the um, nucleus um, to form a pool of the CCC DNA molecules, which is then um, um, the, the matrix for the production of the viral RNAs. <clears throat> the infection, if it takes place in, uh, in adult hosts, so-called horizontal infection, only about 5% of, um, of the patients develop a persistent infection. So the immune system kicks in and uh, clears the virus within several weeks and uh, a lifelong uh, um, um, <clears throat> immunity is produced in these patients, so like uh, in a vaccination. 
But if this takes place in neonates, as I said before, sorry, this is uh, I'm wrong, it's called the vertical um, um, uh, infection, more than 95% of the newborn um, 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 infected patients develop a persistent um, hepatitis B virus infection. And this is the main problem. <clears throat> This chronic hepatitis B has a, a, a lot of um, side effects. It takes quite some time, something like five to 15 years, but in the long run, it will produce in, in a large amount of these patients liver cirrhosis and finally also um, liver cancer, the so-called hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is a, a problem. And as you can think, if this happens to a, a newborn um, baby, these 15 years uh, um, result in, in fatal cancer probably also already with 15 or 20 years, and this is for the society a, a huge uh, health burden. Mm -hmm. So um, what we know about the pathogenesis is that HPV infection itself is not cytolytic, so the, the, the infected cell uh, is not going uh, into apoptosis or uh, uh, um, it's not killed by the HPV infection. And the, the liver damage that one can see in, in patients is uh, mediated by cytotoxic uh, T cells, so it's immune mediated um, liver damage. And then, because the, the liver as an organ has a very high capacity to regenerate, there's an ongoing um, compensatory proliferation. And this is, uh, in, in the end, the basis for tumor establishment. There's also um, uh, integration of the viral genome into the um, host cell genome, but this is not in, in all cancers the case. So this is only a, a secondary effect. <clears throat> the uh, acute infection, this is what, what we know until today. There's a T cell response, which is really strong and uh, multi-specific. So there's a lot of um, cytotoxic T cells. Um, with a lot of different specificities, and they finally can eliminate the virus and clear the virus infection, and then the acute infection is healed and uh, uh, immunity is established. And in comparison to this, in the persistent infection, the T cell response is rather weak. It's only oligoclonal. T cells are uh, uh, exhausted and uh, dysfunctional, and then they finally fail to eradicate the virus, but they still produce damage to the infected organ while there's chronic hepatitis B going on, and this is then in the end resulting in cirrhosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. The therapies that are um, available for the treatment of uh, chronic hepatitis B virus is first the uh, um, interferon alpha, and this is uh, as the therapy it's used in a pegylated um, form, and this is basically an immunostimulatory um, effect that the interferon alpha produces. And at this point, I want to um, show you some results that we um, produced in our institute um, during the last years. Um, it was already known that there's a non-cytopathic elimination of CCC DNA, which can take place in HPV infected cells upon treatment with interferon alpha. There's some clearance events in patients which are treated with interferon alpha, but in the end, there's a, a, um, a broad failure more than 90% of the treated patients. So, but it was known that there is an elimination of CCC DNA, and we wanted to find out how this works. And we um, um, looked in uh, um, HPV infected cell lines for this. And then what uh, a student in our lab finally came up with is these um, effects that he um, um, saw in infected cells. This is either primary human hepatocytes or a cell line which can be infected with the hepatitis B virus. And we did a, a PCR for the CCC DNA molecule within the uh, nucleus of these infected cells. And this is a so-called 3D PCR where you do a gradual um, decrease of the melting temperature during the um, PCR. And what you can see in comparison to the mock treatment where below 70, uh, 87 or 86 degrees, you won't see any amplification of the CCC DNA molecule anymore. In the cells which were treated with interferon alpha, this um, melting temperature was strongly decreased. And this gave us the hint that there has to be some effect on the CCC DNA molecule within the hepatitis B virus infected cell. <clears throat> and to make a long story short, what we finally found was that the triggering of interferon alpha, but um, also the lymphotoxin beta receptor, triggers a molecule which is called ApuBec, 
This is a, a deamination um, protein, which is already known from, um, from the human immunodeficiency virus. And this um, apobag molecule then, um, together with the core protein, which uh, um, binds to the um, viral CCC DNA, is brought to the nucleus. And there, it deaminates the, the, viral, um, the viral DNA genome. And this results in a, a, a uracil excision using a site and the degradation of the CCC DNA without any harm to the, um, to the infected cell. The problem is that uh, <coughs> the um, concentrations that we had to use for interferon alpha, for example, were several times higher than, in, uh, the, than what you could use in a patient. And there I'm coming back to the therapy options. The problem with regulated interferon alpha is that it's got very strong side effects. The patients basically feel like they have uh, a flu and it can also result in depression in the patient. So it's, it's really hard to, to use this. And, and that's um, also a problem why uh, many of these therapy approaches um, fail. The, sec the second um, standard therapy that we have is so-called nucleoside nucleotide analogs. So this is nucleoside or nucleotides, which are specific for the viral um, reverse transcriptase. And they are then incorporated into the new formed um, <coughs> DNA molecule and result in, in um, mutations or stops and uh, um, produce um, not um, functioning viral particles. But uh, the problem with these um, therapies is that there's a really um, fast and very often high um, um, rate of um, resistance mutations. And then we come back to the final problem with the CCC DNA. If something like this happens, strong side effects, or um, one can see that there's a resistance mutation, the therapy has to be ceased. And from the, the CCC DNA, the template for, for transcription within the infected um, cell, which is not really targeted by these um, therapeutic approaches, the um, replication of the virus can start again, and um, one has a relapse of the um, um, viral replication cycle. <clears throat> so as I said, standard antiviral therapy mostly fails. There's only like 10% of the chronic patients um, reacting to the treatment. They further on only inhibit the viral replication cycle. This results in a long-term treatment with the strong side effects, which can already be problematic. And therefore, all the goals that we formulate for future therapies based on the eradication of viral replication template, the so-called CCC DNA. And that's where we come to the um, immunotherapy that we want to do, immunotherapeutic retargeting strategies, and that's how we think that we can accomplish this eradication of uh, the viral CCC DNA by cytotoxically eliminate HPV-infected um, hepatocytes within the infected patient. So how do we do this? If you um, uh, approach immunotherapeutic uh, um, strategies, what you always first need is a, an antigen-specific binding domain. Um, and uh, nature has basically invented two such molecules. First uh, would be the, um, the, the immune globulins antibodies, and the second one would be T cell receptors. <coughs> um, I'm going to talk shortly about the T cell receptors. What you can do is select antigen-specific T cells from patients or from, for example, also vaccinated donors, try to identify the sequence information of the T cell receptor, and then clone and express this in unspecific T cells. This would result in a retargeting of these cells towards new target cells. This is also something that we do in the laboratory, but this um, should not be the topic um, of the today talk. And then another um, um, approach that we follow is the so-called chimeric antigen receptor. So they basically function like a T cell receptor. It's a modular gene product which um, combines different functionalities. In this case, the antigen is bind by an antibody fragment. I'll get back to this later. And then you can use, for example, a vitro or antiviral transduction and express these chimeric antigen receptors also in formerly unspecific T cells. And this also re um, results in the retargeting towards new target cells. I will talk about this also at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> and now I'm coming to our main topic. 
what we are using for our bispecific antibodies is uh, antibody fragments. This is basically starting with the variable domains of an IgG molecule, um, um, and they're sitting on two different chains. I guess everybody of you know this, the, the heavy and the light chain. And then you can basically, you can fuse them by insertion of the linker and you end up with the so-called single chain fragment, which still harbors the same binding, um, um, uh, the same binding domain, probably not the affinity, but the same specificity of the, the parental um, um, anti uh, antibody pr um, protein. <coughs> And then we use one of these um, single chain fragments, for example, directed against human CD3 to um, target uh, in unifactor cells. We incorporated uh, a spacer domain, which is derived from the constant region of the uh, immune globulin. Um, and then we added a second um, single chain antibody fragment, in this case, directed against the hepatitis B virus um, small surface protein called C8. And then because the spacer also um, contains the, the hinge region of the IgG molecule, we get a dimerization and we end up with the so-called bispecific tetravalent antibody, which has got two binding domains for the um, effector cell and two binding domains for the target cell. The chimeric antigen receptors, as I already showed you, basically look the same, the same um, single chain antibody that we're using for targeting of the um, hepatitis B virus surface protein, also a spacer domain, but then there's a transmembrane domain and intracellular signaling domain, and also CD3 theta, and these are expressed in uh, uh, transduced T cells, um, so you end up with uh, uh, T cells um, harboring new specificities, um, um, which are mediated by this hepatitis B virus. Um, specific single chain antibody. And then, just as a reminder, since these antibody fragments bind to native antigens, we're of course completely independent of MHC presentation and the intrinsic TCR specificity of the T cells that we are retargeting. <coughs> just to come back again to the replication cycle, as I, I already explained to you before, the the membrane is um, HPV surface proteins on the infected cells are our um, target antigen. And uh, after expressing the bispecific antibodies, as I've been showing you before, we first, of course, wanted to know if they are capable to bind to HPV positive target cells. And we did this with a, a transgenic um, cell line, which produces um, all um, viral proteins and also produces um, viral particles. And then we uh, incubated these cells with the bispecific um, antibody construct and then counterstained with a, a fluorescently labeled um, antibody, which detects the FC spacer domain in the bispecific antibody. And then we did uh, an analysis on uh, in confocal microscopy. And here you see the, the, the um, micrograph now of the um, cell line called HEPG2. This is a human hepatoma cell line. And this is the negative control. We uh, incubated these cells with uh, supernatant from HBD positive cells, which contains um, all um, um, subviral and viral particles, as I told you before, to test for the unspecific attachment of these viral particles to the cellular surface. And then we um, counterstained with uh, DAPI and uh, a marker of the cellular membrane in green. And uh, if we do the same now, on HPV transgenic cells called HEPG2 to 215, you can see this blue sur surface um, staining here of the bispecific antibody against CD28 and also CD3, which attach to the surface of the HPV positive cells. So these bispecific antibodies specifically bind HPV surface proteins on these HEPG2 to 215 cells. I can also um, show you this in a higher magnification where you can really see nicely this um, um, surface staining. And what you can also see is that there's negative cells and this is a, a, a very typical feature of these cells because not all of them, although they are transgenic, um, express uh, and replicate the hepatitis B virus. And this is due to the differentiation state of these cells. So you always see this, that you also have negative cells in these cultures.
So now let me come to our um, um, immunotherapeutic drug um, strategy. We call this retargeting of effector cells, and this is how we um, think it finally works. So you have the bispecific antibody bound either to the target cell or to the effector cell, and by binding the second antigen, it brings these two cells together, and then um, the binding and the clustering of these bindings on the T cell um, results in, in, uh, in the um, establishment of an immunological synapse, and this results in uh, induction of apoptosis of the target cell. <clears throat> and this is where um, the uh, exelligence machine comes in. We measure these um, 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 co-cultures of effector cells and HPV-positive target cells on the exelligence machine. Lena already ex uh, explained this system, so just in short again, this is these um, gold um, electrodes which are interdigitated on the bottom of a 96 well plate, and then there's a, a current between the two electrodes, and you can then measure the amount of adherent cells, and this is uh, um, mirroring very, very nicely the, um, um, the survival of these um, target cells, so an incidence-based measurement um, of the electric field. <coughs> And if we do this, this is what we finally get. This is a co-culture of uh, an, an HPV-positive target cell line. In this case, uh, it's a cell line called HUH7. It's also a human hepatoma cell line. And we did uh, the second um, cell line um, um, transgenic for the hepatitis E virus F protein. This um, results in production of only subviral particles, but our um, target antigen, the HPV surface protein, is present there. And then we um, measure the, the cell index as a, a measurement for the survival of these cells. And the red arrow indicates where we added the um, T cells together with a combination of the bispecific antibody directed against CD3. And we also have a bispecific antibody directed against CD28 to produce a co-stimulatory signal, which uh, um, uh, is, is needed for the activation of T cells. And then this is a dose dependency experiment here. You can see that the HPV negative um, cells, which have been treated the same way, they also receive um, peripheral blood monocytes together with the um, antibody construct. The viability stays uh, is basically unchanged um, over an amount of 70 hours. But if we do the same on the HPV positive target cells, we see a really fast and strong cytotoxic effect of the PBMCs which is mediated by the bispecific antibodies that we add. And if we decrease the um, concentration of the bispecific antibody, this, is, uh, this process is, is slower, but we end up at almost the same amount of um, cytotoxicity um, within the given, um, given time frame. So we can say that these bispecific antibodies um, clearly mediate a specific elimination of the HPV-positive target cells. <coughs> And then a very important um, um, analysis always is the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is a, a, a clear marker of a proper activation of the um, um, redirected effector cells. And therefore, we measured interferon gamma um, um, by ELISA over time. And you can see this really strong increase um, up to 48 hours. We also measured interleukin-2, which would be a, a survival and proliferative signal, almost the same dynamics, but uh, it reaches a plateau after 24 hours. And we also um, measured the secretion of t um, um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which also strongly induced, but then declined um, after 24 hours. So you can see all these three pro-inflammatory pro cytokines are induced and secreted to a really high amount and a high level in these co-cultures of um, peripheral mononuclear cells and the bispecific antibodies together with HBV-positive um, target cells. But, uh, and then we compared the, the um, bispecific antibodies against CD3 and CD28 to another version um, of these bispecific antibodies that we also produced, which contain mutations in the um, FC space or domain so that they cannot bind the FC gamma receptor anymore. And, um, the binding of the um, FC gamma receptor can um, activate um, natural killer cells and result in antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. We thought that this might be a problem finally in the in the treatment. Therefore, we also constructed these um, um, bispecific antibodies containing these mutations. And the comparison shows that um, also these um, 
mutated by specific antibodies are fully functional. They seem to be a little bit slower, but um, this might also be due to the, um, um, the concentration that we use because we, we, um, we don't have these antibodies in a fully purified um, 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 way until now, so we can never 100% be sure which amount of antibodies we are using until now. <coughs> So these um, delta ADCC constructs are a little bit less active, but they all, uh, and mediate slightly lower cytotoxicity. But in the end, after 70 hours, also basically all target cells are eliminated. <coughs> and then we wanted to go deeper in the secretion of uh, um, cytokines, and um, there's a, a method called intracellular cytokine staining. And the the beauty of this method is that it can measure the secretion of more than one cytokines. In this case, we again measured interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and um, interleukin 2, but on a single cell um, basis. And this is uh, called uh, polyfunctionality because it is known now that if a cell really produces all these three cytokines within one cell, it's, it's really polyfunctional. While this polyfunctionality is lost over time and upon chronic um, activation, and this then also. Um, it's a marker for exhaustion and dysfunction. And what we saw if we measure this on CD4 and also on CD8 cells, that the addition of the two bispecific antibodies against CD3 and CD28 in co-cultures with um, um, uh, the HPV positive target cells again, result in, a, um, in, in, in something like 2.5% of really tri-functional cells expressing all three cytokines and a large amount of cells which um, still produce two of the cytokines. So we can see that this redirection that we produce by our uh, or with our bispecific antibodies is really a polyfunctional activation, which then should be capable um, of a, a really good therapeutic um, effect. Uh, uh, upon therapeutic application. <clears throat> so there's a polyfunctional signal signature of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines produced by our immune therapeutic um, approach. And then another experiment that we did is um, uh, we wanted to find out more about the mechanisms of um, cytotoxicity and a uh, very typical assay for this is also a flow cytometry based uh, um, measurement of uh, LEMP1, which is a marker inside the, the vesicles which contain perforin and granzyme. And once these perforin granzyme containing um, particles are released in the um, immunological synapse, this marker gets to the surface of the cell and then the cell um, stains positive for LEMP1. And we did this again with CD4 cells. Uh, combination of the CD3 and CD28 specific bispecific antibodies, and also the um, um, bispecific antibodies which um, contain this mutation in the FC receptor to um, abrogate FC gamma receptor um, 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 binding. And you can see here in the red curve that the LAMP1 is really specifically upregulated in code cultures with the um, HPV positive target cells in comparison to the HPV negative target cells. And this was also the case on CD8 positive um, T cells as we measured in, uh, in, uh, in flow cytometry. So these constructs mediate a target specific degranulation, uh, and um, this is uh, the, the most probably the mechanism of cytotoxicity in our retargeting um, approaches. And then a very important question was also always because the dogma of um, immunology is that you need signals for T cell receptor signaling, which would be the CD3 triggering, but you also need the co-stimulatory signal. So we asked ourselves if the um, bispecific antibodies can also act uh, um, singly. So we did an experiment where we compared the combination as we've um, before always used it to a single administration of the CD28 and the CD3 specific bispecific antibodies on, again, these uh, um, S protein um, transgenic cell lines, and you can see the, the combination again results in a very really fast and strong killing, but also the CD3 specific antibody alone mediates almost the same amount of killing. And what was most striking to us is that also the CD28 specific um, antibody can mediate uh, a cytotoxic response in comparison to the um, HPV negative target cells. And what, what we um, hypothesized from this is that if you have enough clustering of these bispecific antibodies, 
due to the S protein on the target cell and binding to CD28 on the um, effector T cell, this kind of forces the T cell into um, uh, cytotoxicity, even if there's no um, CD3 triggering and, and if there was no CD3 binding um, uh, antibody in these experiments. So the bispecific antibodies mediate lysis of HPV positive target cells in a synergistic manner, but they can also do this singly, um, as we can see in this uh, experiment here. <coughs> And then this is a really important experiment. This goes back to the um, unspecific binding and uh, also the vast amounts of viral and subviral particles which would be swimming in the blood of an infection, infected patient. Because one can think that the, the T cell, which already has bound the bispecific antibody, could theoretically bind the, the free swimming viral or subviral particles in the blood and then result in an, in an unspecific and unwanted activation of the T cells. Um, uh, far apart from the, uh, far away from the from the target organ and the HPV infected cells in the liver. So what we did here was uh, um, this is a cell free um, uh, target cell free assay. We coated subviral particles which we isolated in the lab to the plastic surface of a 96 well plate. And in the second well we did the same, but before we added the subviral particles. We completely saturated the plastic surface with um, with albumin, so that the viral particles cannot bind or, uh, or attach to the plastic surface anymore. If we then add the bispecific antibodies together with um, um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells again, we can only see a, a full activation. This is a production of interferon gamma in the um, in the wells which had been immobilized with the hepatitis B virus S protein in the form of these subviral particles. But if the subviral particles cannot attach to the plastic surface anymore, so they are free swimming, there is no activation at all. And this gave us the hint, or this is our hypothesis now, is that one single subviral particle, which would be bound by a T cell and a bispecific antibody, just is not enough to form an immunological synapse. As I said in the beginning, these subviral particles are very small. They're only 20 nanometers thick. So there's just not enough surface area to really cluster the bispecific antibodies together with the, the target antigen on the effector cell. And there's no um, immunological synapse um, established. And therefore, there's absolutely no activation of the T cells upon binding of only subviral particles. And this surface area is only produced if the subviral particles are really immobilized to the plastic surface and thereby trigger this uh, um, clustering of the bispecific antibodies. <clears throat> and since all these experiments I've been showing you so far were done with transgenic cell lines, which is a little bit artificial, we also replicated this in HPV infected cells. We can use these HEPA-RG cells, which I've also showed you in the beginning of the um, experiment with uh, interferon alpha treatment. This is a cell line which can be differentiated by um, addition of DMSO and further supplements. And then you um, differentiate these cells for um, um, 10 to um, 20 days. And you end up with a, 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 a fracture of the cells being fully differentiated. And this is then the cells which can be infected naturally with the hepatitis B virus. And you usually end up with 5 to 15% of the cells within the culture being um, productively infected with the hepatitis B virus. And then we did this again on the exelligent machine and we compared the CD3 um, antibodies alone again to the, com uh, to the combination of the two antibodies. And in this case, we saw a clear killing of the HPV infected cells. And this amount, which you can see here, mirrors more or less this amount of infected cells, which would be between 10 to 15% of the cells. So we think that this is really um, um, specific and it also works on HPV infected cells, which really nicely mirror the, the natural situation of an HPV infection. <clears throat> so I'll come to the, the summary of the, the first part now with the bispecific antibodies. We saw that we um, can uh, attach them to the surface of infect or to the surface of HPV positive and hepatocytes and stain this uh, um, with the fluorescently labeled antibodies um, by confocal microscopy. We can also retarget um, um, T effector cells with these bispecific um, antibody constructs. And this results in the apoptosis of the target cell 
either as protein transfected hepatoma cells, but also HPV infected hepatogen cells. <clears throat> and what we also saw is that there's a really high level secretion of pro inflammatory cytokines. We measured interferon gamma, CNS alpha, and uh, interleukin 2. And this is also uh, um, done in a polyfunctional ma um, manner, as we saw in the um, flow cytometry experiments of um, polyfunctionality. <clears throat> So let me now come shortly to the chimeric antigen receptors. This is uh, uh, the secondary project that we are following. Um, I already introduced you to those in the beginning. So they are also um, harboring this um, hepatitis B virus S protein specific um, single chain antibody fragment, a spacer, a transmembrane domain, and then the signaling domains of CD28. CD3 theta together to um, also provide um, uh, um, T cell receptor signaling and co stimulatory signal. And these are um, um, transfused into um, primary T cells by a uh, retroviral transduction system. And we know that this uh, is also working. This, is, this was my, um, my PhD thesis. And then when I went for uh, my postdoc, another PhD student took it over and uh, introduced the whole system into an in vivo um, system. And this is the data that I want to um, show you now. So um, a very short introduction into um, adoptive um, and cell therapy. What you basically would do with these cells is you would take the, the, the um, cells of an uh, HPV positive, chronically HPV positive patient, you would uh, um, isolate T cells um, um, by specific um, sorting protocols and then stimulate them and then add the viral vector which um, transduces the cells to express the chimeric antigen receptor and you would do different um, 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 quality controls and finally re-infuse these cells into the patient to give him back cells which now have the capability of targeting um, um, hepatitis B virus infected cells. And where we are right now is the um, in vivo model, and we, we test this in hepatitis B virus transgenic mice. As I told you in the beginning, the, the, the mice, they are not really um, um, infectable with the hepatitis B virus, but there's a mouse um, which uh, um, expresses hepatitis B virus proteins in the liver and also produces um, viral and subviral particles. So this mirrors the situation um, of a chronic um, patient. <clears throat> So what we did was um, using these uh, um, transgenic mice. Uh, and the, Dr. Paul, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think um, we're running very short on the time. Oh, so do you think? Oh, okay, you... okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, I don't. I don't see. Uh, I, I just go very fastly through these last. It's, I think it's four more. Four more slides. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So we basically did a, a mouse experiment. Uh, uh, we injected the car positive T cells. We saw that only the um, S-specific CAR resulted in homing of T cells into the liver, while this was not the case in the controls, as you can see here in this dark violet staining. And then we saw that only the S-CAR here on the right resulted in a reduction of HPV replicating cells. This was also mirrored by the HPV DNA, which was uh, measured in the serum or in the liver cells. Only the S-CAR was really specifically eliminating the HPV DNA. And we saw um, uh, 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 um, uh, some um, liver um, um, transaminases coming up, but very, um, um, very um, narrow in the, in the time frame. And then we saw that there was also IL-2 coming up at the same time as the, the liver damage was reduced again, uh, IL-10, sorry, and this is a regulatory cytokine, which most probably really dampened this um, artificial T cell response. So let me um, sum this up fastly. So we saw that they can be transferred. They, they were transferred into the um, peritoneum and they home to the liver, which is very important. They specifically and cytotoxically uh, were active against HPV positive target cells. Um, this resulted in a marked reduction of HPV replication markers and there was this transient uh, um, effect, which was most probably due to the negative regulation um, by um, IL-10. So uh, let me come to the acknowledgments. First of all, I have to um, thank my, my boss, Ulrike Protze. She really um, helped me over all these years that we've um, spent together. These are the people which mainly worked on this, our um, collaborators who worked uh, together with us on the bispecific antibodies and, of course, the whole group here in Munich. And uh, now I want to thank you for your attention. And whenever you want to contact me, here's my email. Thank you very much.
Well, Dr. Bang, thank you very, very much. Uh, this is a, a fantastic um, um, presentation, and not only you showed, um, you know, the basic how you uh, construct this uh, antibody, but you know, show all the way the uh, in vitro assay to the animal test. And uh, I just heard that uh, even Roche Pharmaceutical is very interested in your study. Uh, you're, you know, moving into uh, more uh, uh, collaboration into this. So uh, congratulations again for the fantastic job in this field. Thank you very much, Lena. Yeah. So. Um, uh, we had mentioned that um, people can um, uh, uh, drop some um, uh, questions um, throughout the uh, presentation, but um, due to the interest of time, um, and actually uh, some of the question I believe has already been uh, answered uh, during the presentation by Dr. Bonds. Um, so if you have more uh, questions, uh, please send it to me, and I'll pass it to Dr. Bong, and I will make sure to um, uh, to get back to you. Um, Um, so before uh, we wrap up this uh, presentation, um, um, I would like to quickly uh, make a uh, a few announcements. Um, so if you're interested in um, using Exelligence RTCA technology, we actually do have a research grant that would um, provide um, a, uh, the scientists with a uh, system uh, consumable and consultation for up to six months. And the uh, second cycle of this year's application um, is actually uh, coming very soon next Monday. Um, so you're welcome to apply for this grant and join the uh, past winner uh, to use our uh, Isologens uh, system. And you can type uh, www at acabio.com backslash grant to get more information and also um, to uh, this is a future event, so uh, uh, we welcome you to join us uh, at the uh, GTC Novel Immunotherapy Summit uh, here in San Diego in January, and also the Keystone Symposium uh, on Tumor Immunology, and also SOT meeting in March in San Diego. We will, and our user will be present a more uh, cutting edge uh, and breakthroughs uh, in this uh, meetings. And finally, I would like to thank you very much for taking time of your busy schedule to uh, participate this event. And special thanks to our speaker, Dr. Bong, to uh, uh, to uh, tell us this exciting story. And if you have more questions, please just email me. My email is lzhao at acabio.com. And if you want to learn more, just log on to our webpage and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and come back to our WebEx to see um, the recording and also the past event. Uh, with that, I would like to wrap up today's uh, symposium. Thank you again for participating.